Okay, Steve, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We always say that the spirit of spin stops right here, because we really care for you. Steve, we get to give our folks about 15 seconds or time or so. Uh, you can just uh, sort of estimate it, and then go ahead and uh, pray for us. Father, it's with great uh, anticipation that we come to study your word tonight. We ask your blessing about all this taught here that we can further our walk in the spiritual life to mm-hmm. reach spiritual maturity. That's the goal of the Christian way yes. of life, to be like Christ is humanity. We have that opportunity here tonight, Father, if we just be in tune with you and spear the spirit and listen with our ears on. We'll, we'll catch some doctrine that will strengthen that walk. Yes. And these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Steve. Uh, our, actually, our study tonight is a continuation of Acts chapter th- uh, 16, and this is actually part three. We've already done one and two. We're in part three. Uh, there will be a part four because I don't know that we'll finish this particular part, but if we do, we're going to right into, into part four tonight and then finish it on Sunday morning and then go into chapter 17. So let's pick up right where we left off uh, last, uh, would have been Monday night, and let me introduce where we're going here just by way of a bit of a review. Paul and Silas are now on their second missionary journey. Uh, actually, uh, Paul's on his second missionary journey. You remember who he went, went with the first time? Begins uh, with a B? Uh, uh, Bar- Barnabas. Barnabas, that's and, uh, exactly right. Mark, John Mark chipped out on him. That's he. <laughs> John Mark skipped out on him mm. when they got when they got uh, up to Perga mm. uh, in uh, after they'd gone to, to Cyprus and then gone up to Perga. Well, anyway, uh, Paul and Silas now are on the second missionary journey. And um, Barnabas took John Mark with him, and they went down to Cyprus. So we see that um, um, Paul and Silas start out in Antioch. They went north just a little bit, and then they went and then they went west, and they ended up going to Derby, and that was the last city that they were in when they went the for, on the first missionary journey. So they're going sort of re- retracing their steps. So they went to Derby, and then they went from Derby to Lystra. And it, when they got to Lystra, they met this young uh, young believer by the name of Timothy, and he was uh, he, he was really knowledgeable of the scripture. He'd been uh, taught the scripture by his grandmother and his mother, and he was well known in Lystra and the next city over, which is Iconium. They said they they had really get, given a good report on this young man. So Paul and Silas decided we're going to take Tim, uh, Timothy with us. So from there then, in Lystra, they went, uh, went on west, and they met Luke then in this next journey when they got to the city of Troas, which is where they were going to catch the boat to go on over to Macedonia. So they met Luke in, in the area of Troas, and at that point in time, Luke joined the team. So now what we have is we've got Paul, we've got Silas, we've got Timothy, and got Luke. And Luke is the man then that actually wrote the book of Luke, and actually the writer of the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. So Luke is going to be with them for a short period of time. Now, when they when they meet Luke then, he joins the team. So Paul's team now at this point is, in fact, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Now, that takes care of the first 10 verses in chapter 16. Let's pick up now, because now what we're going to do is we're going to go on another boat ride. Mm-hmm. They're in Troas, and it's just on the, on the, the seaport, of the Aegean Sea. Now, what's going to happen, Steve? We're going to see in this verse they're going to get in. The, they're going to get on the boat. These four of them, and they're going to go over to. Uh, they're going to end up in Philippi, but they're going to cross the Aegean Sea, and in so doing, they're going to first of all they're leaving Troas, and they're going to go to a small island off the coast that's called Samothrace. Then what happens is when you look at the maps that you can see. You can see Troas, and you can see Samothrace, but you can't see the other little island. You can't see Macedonia, where they're going. So what you see is 
two things. You see Troas and, and Samothrace. Then you come over here and you see this other island. It doesn't have a name. There, mm -hmm. It has a name, but it's not on the map. You see this other little island, and then you see this place where they're going to where they're going to land over there to go to uh, to go to Philippi. But here's what happens: they leave Troas, and you start out, and you got to go north like this around that Samothrace. But they're gonna they're gonna stop there and get, uh, for a day, and then they're gonna go on to the other place. So they go to this island, then they got to go up and go around this other island and then end up in the, uh, the seaport in order to be able to go uh, to, um, uh, to Philippi. So why don't you go ahead and read verse 11 for us and see what we got here. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a single straight course to Samothrace and on the following day to Neapolis. Yes. So what that really, what that really means is when they, when they put out to sea, they're in a boat, okay? And they ran a straight course. Now, what that means is when they, when they ran it, there were favorable winds so that, you, see, you know, like in an airplane, you get this headwind, you, you run into it, it takes a little longer to get there. But the, uh, at this point in time, they had, uh, they had good winds. Tailwind. And, and, yeah, <laughs> and they're actually going to get there in, uh, in a day, and then go on the next day, they're going to go on to, uh, to Neapolis. Coming back from that area, it's going to take them five days to get there. Mm. So what happened? The winds were the winds were <laughs> oh, yeah. against them this way. So okay. So here they are. They're putting out the sea from Troas, and they ran a straight course to Samothrace. That's that little island. If you're looking at a map, it's a little island off the coast of uh, off the coast of Troas. And on that day, on the next day, then they actually went on and sailed into Neapolis. So really, from from Troas to Neapolis, they, this was a this was a two day trip. Now, in, from there then, once they get to Neapolis, and Neapolis is, in fact, the, uh, the seaport town. But what they're, what they're doing is they're going into Macedonia, and so they're on their way to Philippi. And so in order to get to Philippi, they're going to have to travel from, from Neapolis up there. So read verse 12 for us. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, Roman colony. And uh, we were staying in this city for some days. Okay, so... Here's the, they get to, they're, they're going to get to Philippi, and they're going to stay there for a period of time. So in an, uh, an exposition, and from there, Neapolis, they went to Philippi, and Philippi was a few, mi few miles in town, in fact, 10 miles. So once they get to seaport, now they've got to get, find transportation to get up to. So they're probably going to Uber, okay? They're going to, <laughs> yeah. they're going to get a mule Uber or something like that. <laughs> sure, absolutely, yeah. So but we've, what we learned, though, is that, in fact, uh, Philippi, where they're going, is in fact a leading city hmm. of the district of Macedonia, and that that idea that uh, Philippi is a is a leading city, we're going to see some more about that. And uh, it was a Roman, it was actually a Roman colony. And he said we were staying in the city for some days. Now what happened is they're going to go they're going to go through uh, Samothrace, and they're going to go to get on to Neapolis. And uh, then they get in here to Philippi, but when they get there, they're going to stay there for a period of time. So what we want to do is find out something about this place called Philippi. What, what did we learn about it? Well, Philippi was a chief city in that part of Macedonia, and it was a colony of Rome, and it functioned as a military post. Outpost. Yeah, it was a military outpost, yes. yes. And so it, it's actually in Macedonia. Now, we have another, another uh, superscript here. So th this is what we find out about Philippi. And keep these things in mind because that kind of information, Roman colony, mm -hmm. because what we're going to find out is something terrible is going to happen to Paul mm -hmm. and Silas and Timothy and Luke in this town. And uh, if we don't understand what the fact that it's a Roman colony, it really is just a nice Bible study, but it doesn't really mean anything to us. So a little bit of history is, is helpful to us. Secondly, we find out that this, it's a leading city in Macedonia, a district of Macedonia, and it was a Roman colony. What does that mean, Steve? Well, a Roman colony possessed a, an autonomous government and was immune from taxation and other forms of mandatory tribute. So really what amounts to a Roman colony has some, has some perks to it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't start out with one, but they could, they could assign you colony status. Privileges. And when that, when that happened, you in that city, you have, you've got some, some privileges. That's exactly right. Now, a couple other bullet points here. So uh, let's share these with us. Well, because of its proximity to the sea and location along trade routes to Europe, 
It was a commercial center. So it is, in fact, a very, very important city. Now, Paul's going to some other cities, and notice he's traveled through some, through some regions, and when he was going through those, it doesn't say he stopped anywhere. And so th- th- that's, that's pretty important. So he's going to, he's going to a place here which is a commercial center. Now, what about this next bullet point? As a city of great influence in the region, it was just the right place uh, to serve as a launching pad for evangelistic activities in the region. So that's exactly what they're going to do. They, they're going to spend a few days there, and we're going to find out to them, uh, later what happens to them while they're in that town and uh, what happened to them after they left, okay? Mm-hmm. So next, uh, next thing we find in verse 13 is they're on, they're out, they're on to prayer. So it's, it's time to go to prayer. So they're on to prayer, and that leads them to witnessing. So apparently at this point in time, we're not going into a synagogue because look here, what day are they going on? Look at this. <clears throat> what day are they going on? And, a Sabbath. And, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that uh, there would be a, a good place of prayer. Mm-hmm. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So what happened, the, the four of them, they said, okay, it's the Sabbath. Let's, let's go pray. And so they went out they went out to Riverside to do this. And when they got there, they ran into a group of women who were, the, who were assembled there. Now, it doesn't, doesn't tell us much about them except the fact that when they get out there and we're going to sit down and pray, and look, here's a group of women. So we've already indicated up here as a city of great influence in the region, it was just the right place to serve as a launching pad for evangelistic activities in that region. So we're going to see that they're they're just about to start that right now. So as uh, as as an exposition of that, go ahead and read this again and sort of fill in the blanks and we'll see about this prayer deal. And on the Sabbath day, we, that's Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke, went outside the gate to a riverside mm-hmm. where they were supposing that that would be a good place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled there. Okay, now we've got, a, we've, got, uh, we've, got three, we've got three superscripts, but they're all the same number, riverside, prayer, and assembled. So let's talk about that. Under normal conditions, mm-hmm. when Paul gets someplace like this, he's actually going to look for a synagogue yeah. because we found out that he is a, he's both a Roman and a Jew. Uh, his mother was a Jew. His father was a Roman. It was a Gentile. So what happened, and I should specify that, she, she was a Jewess. He was a Gentile, okay? Now, we, we know that if, a, uh, if a, you have a mixed marriage, and the children, the children of that marriage then, they take on the religion of the mother. But as a Gentile father, he is in command in the home, okay? That, that was under, that was under uh, Greek rule at that point in time. So what we have then, they're, they're going out, and we say we're going to look at Riverside, Prayer, and Assembled. So under normal conditions, Paul would actually go into a synagogue. So what's the first bullet point here? Possibly there was no synagogue in Philippi, which also indicates that there were very few Jews living there. That's right. So there's no, apparently no synagogue there because they don't go to the synagogue it's the Sabbath. Where do you go on the Sabbath? You go to the synagogue. But because they didn't go to the synagogue, uh-uh, there must not be one there, so they go to the riverside to pray, okay? Now, th- we've got two small uh, mm. sub-points here also. So what is this? It only took 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. So if there's no, if there's no synagogue there, it only takes men. 10 men. See, this is why, Steve, when you understand mm-hmm. this stuff, it begins to make sense to you, okay? So since it only took 10 Jews to, to form a synagogue, guess what? And guess, here again, if a, Jew, if a Jew is a Jew, and he is, he wants to go to synagogue on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. So if there's none there, mm-hmm. there's, they're not going to go there. So possibly no synagogue in the town. Next ball point. According to the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, it was common for worshipers of Yahweh to gather at a river or by the sea on the Sabbath day to pray and worship together if there was no synagogue. See, that's why they went to the riverside. Uh-huh. See, and Josephus is, in fact, a very, very uh, important Jewish historian who actually lived during the time of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the next, the next bullet point here. Go ahead. Evidently, there were no men at the riverside, so Paul met with the women. That's exactly right. You know, I, and I, I know that 
please understand me when I say this, just a bit of humor. Here they are. These guys are, these guys are out going to pray, and they go down to the riverside, and guess what? They run into a group of women down there. And they, so what do they do? They, pay, they make a, take up a conversation with these women. My thought was they hadn't yet heard of the Me Too movement. <laughs> okay. yeah. So anyway, they sit down and they, they, they're going to witness to these women. Now, what happens is while they're doing this and witnessing to these women, we're going to see that the Lord opens Lydia's heart. We're going to open up Lydia's heart, okay? And we need to find out who this woman Lydia is and find out something about her and what actually took place. So go ahead and read this verse. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics and a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now, interestingly enough, uh, notice where she's from? Thyatira. She's from Thyatira. Now, she is, uh, she's, well, where is she now, though? She's what? in, in uh, beginning with P. Uh, uh, Where's Paul? Where's Paul right uh, now? Phila, Phil, Philippi. Philippi. That's right. And and by the waterside, riverside. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. So, but they're in the they're in the city of Philippi. I guess they're still in the city, but the river must be by oh, the yeah. city or something. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're still in the city. Mm -hmm. But the 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 issue though is that they are in Philippi, and this lady is in Philippi, and she actually lives mm -hmm. in Thyatira. Okay. Now, when you take a look and see where Thyatira is, you say, wait a minute, you know. And uh, I don't have the map here now, but it would help somebody to see what's going on mm. because this woman is traveling from Thyatira down here to uh, to Philippi mm -hmm. and she's doing that for a particular reason. She is a seller of what? Mm. Purple fabrics. Purple fabrics, so okay. She's, uh, business trip. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. But she's also a what? A worshiper of God. A worshiper of God. And guess what? What the, uh, Paul and uh, Paul and Silas and his team sit down there and begin to Take up a conversation, make a conversation, and guess what they were doing? She was doing what? She listening. was she was listening, okay? Uh -huh. And so while she was listening to what Paul was saying, and here it is, they've gone into this area to evangelize, and all of a sudden Lydia hears all this information, and it says, "Who opened her heart? The Lord." Opened Lord her heart. opened her heart to respond to the things that were spoken by Paul. She's on so positive volition. That's see, that's <laughs> exactly right. Positive at the point of God consciousness, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's move on and take a look at this then and see again. Read this and take a look at the number of take a look at the number of superscripts. They're going to help us to understand something about this mm -hmm. this uh, this verse. Go ahead and say it again. And a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, mm -hmm. a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, that's concentrating, yes. and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things, that's the gospel we know, yes. spoken by Paul. Okay, so so Paul is actually sharing the gospel with him right now. And the Lord opened her heart. So what we want to do is we find out something about this. And I've got five superscripts here in order to try to understand something about the verse. Well, a, a woman named Lydia. Who was she, Steve? A businesswoman. That's exactly right. Now, where was she from? Number two here. Thyatira. Read the whole thing. Thyatira, Lydia's hometown, was famous for its dyes and fabrics. Stop right there. She's, she's from Thyatira. That city was known and it was famous for dyes and fabrics, okay? Now, where is Thyatira located? It's located in Asia, the region to which Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to travel. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, he, see he, he, uh, he and Silas uh, and Timothy were going That's from right. Derby to, to uh, they were going from Derby to Lystra uh -huh. where they met, where they met Timothy. And they sort of, whoops, uh, Paul thought, well, maybe we're up this way. Macedonia right? or something. Was it? We, what's that? Was it Macedonia? No, no, they're in Macedonia now. Okay, That's no. where they are. But they were going to go up into Bithynia. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're going to go up sort of northeast. Mm -hmm. And God, the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going that way. And he said, I've, in other words, I've got something else for you. You don't need to go that direction. And that, we said last uh, Monday night, that's actually uh, the region where, where Peter's going to go. We said the reason we believe that possible that uh, God didn't lead Paul to go that direction because Paul, Peter was going to be assigned to that area, and you don't need these two apostles in the same area. Interesting enough, um, there's, some, there's something about that, that idea that I learned from, from the colonel, from our theme. Um, for years, for years, 
I wanted to get him to come up here because he goes to he went to California, he's going to New England, he's going here, going there, and preaching Bible conferences. And I, I'm a young young pastor under being influenced by him. I wanted it, one of my mentors to come to this area to teach, but he kept refusing. He kept refusing. He kept refusing. And this is one of those things where uh, I, you know I didn't know him. I didn't know him intimately. But when he, uh, when we got together, uh, he invited us. He invited us to dinner with him. We'd go to dinner with him and sit around the table and talk for an hour. Uh, so I tried, wanted to get him to come here. And Gene Cunningham was up in Conway. We both tried to get him to come. We tried to get him to come for year in and year out. And, and here's what he said. He said no. He said I'm not coming to your area. He said, why should I come to your area when you, there's already somebody in that area teaching Bible doctrine? <laughs> so he refused to come because here was W.O. Vaught was in First mm -hmm. Man, Emmanuel Baptist mm -hmm. Church. Gene was in Cunningham. Gene was in, in Conway. And we had uh, Jim Myers was out, in, uh, was out in Hot Springs and had a young man, man whose last name was Duke that was down in, uh, down in Hope, Arkansas. And yourself. So, Yes, and I was yeah, and I was here in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. So he said, "No, I'm not coming there." He said, "Why should I come there?" He says, "You're already getting doctrine. Why don't I go someplace yeah. where they're not getting doctrine?" Well, it took eight years. We finally <laughs> convinced him to come, and he did. But the the issue here is Peter was going to go that area. God was going God was going to sign him there, and so why send Paul up in that area? Mm -hmm. Go someplace else. Okay, so that's exactly what happened. So. Uh, Lydia is actually from Thyatira, and she's from uh, the uh, located in Asia. And when you see that, when you see the distance she had, she's got to get there by boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, that she's got to come by boat also. So here it is. Uh, said uh, Lydia's Lydia's in Thyatira. She's over there now. And I said, so here's what I said. Oh yeah. So it, it, watch this. Mm -hmm. Just stop and think about this. Yeah, she's from Thyatira. She's over here in Philippi, and Paul says, let's go up here into, into this area, into Asia, and the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going there. I want you to go this way. So now when you realize that she's from Thyatira, she getting a boat to come over to, to Philippi. She's over there doing business, and isn't amazing that Paul just shows up. Yeah, so it says here, Thyatira is located in Asia, the region to which Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to travel. And I say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Lydia just happened to be in Philippi. And Paul arrived in town. God knew she would be there, and so he and he, he saw the positive volition in that lady's heart. So he says, "Paul, you going over here, okay?" So knowing that later on she could go back there, where he oh, couldn't, and she could get back in her own country with the gospel and all that. You know. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we see here that she was a seller. Of, she was a seller of purple. Let's talk about this right here, then. And by the way, this is called rubia tinctorum. Right here, mm -hmm. Rubia Tinctor. So it reads this thing about purple dye, well, okay? Purple dye had to be gathered drop by drop from a certain type of a shellfish, the murex, mm -hmm. or from the root of a certain type of plant, the matter plant, Rubia Tichorum. Yeah, so, so what happens is here she is. She's over there in Thyatira. That's where this, that's where this purple dye is, uh, is famous, for the, famous from that area, as, as well as the fabric. And this stuff has to drop drip, 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 drip. And she is a seller of purple, so she's using this to dye the fabric to sell. Now, it's interesting. She's over here in Thyatira. She's coming all the way over there to Philippi because it is a, it's a commercial center, okay? Mm -hmm. So she's going over there to sell her stuff. So how about this purple? Read this. Purple is the color of royalty and uh, indicates that Lydia's customers could afford the more expensive linens and cloths that resulted from such a labor of an extensive process. See, that's exactly right. So this this woman is going all the way over here to sell this, and it's ex, it's expensive. Uh, you know, the, the the amount of time you have to spend waiting on the dye, preparing the dye, doing the doing the fabrics, and then you get. So let, let's just suppose. Let's just for the fun of it say it cost a hundred dollars to dye this purple dress. And you live in a poverty stricken area. Mm -hmm. Who are you gonna sell to? Nobody. You no. can't do it, you see? So 
Do you think, Dr. Jim, uh, how close was Philippi, to, it was said by the Riverside, how close was it to that uh, uh, ocean uh, sea area they tra traveled to? She might have been also going there if this was some shellfish, and Asia didn't have much shellfish. She may have also been going there to gather some dye to... Well, well no, I, listen, no, I think that's speculation. Yeah, what we be. do know is this. Mm -hmm. We know that we know that this comes from shellfish, and it comes from the root of, of a tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we know that that area, Five Tire, was known for that. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, here's the issue: she's coming over there to sell. Basically, if there are any other motivations, we don't know. But what we do know is she was coming over there to sell because this is expensive. This is expensive clothing, and, and, royalty, royalty. and uh -huh. purple was the color of royalty, mm -hmm. and indicates. That, that Lydia's customers could afford mm. could afford more expensive linens. And what we're going to see is what the scripture has to say about this purple being used somewhere. Let's go all the way back to Mark, Mark chapter 15, verse 17. And they dressed him, speaking of Jesus, in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. See, this is the time of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And so what do they do? Oh, yeah, you're, yeah, sure, you're a king, you're royalty. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just dress you in purple. See, that purple was a color of royalty. So they actually thrust this on Jesus. They were mocking him. Yeah, they, they were mocking him at this point. Him. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. But we also see in Luke chapter 16. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. See, this is, this is a rich man. Mm -hmm. So here again, we, we get the connection here between Lydia and why she's over there in, in Philippi, and here's Paul out here. He's, he's on his journey. He's going somewhere looking, to, looking mm -hmm. to evangelize, and they get over here into Philippi. There's no synagogue in town, so they get ready to go out to pray, and it just this is not an accident that she was on the riverside, and Paul, Paul and Silas, he got there too. So she wouldn't have been in a synagogue had they been there. That's she? exactly right. No, would, no, it wouldn't have mm -hmm. been. Yeah. Now, here's the issue. Uh, Re Revelation chapter 18, verse 16. Whoa, whoa, the great city. She who was dressed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. So the that's issue is, royalty. that's right. See, that's the idea. It is an indication of royalty. That The idea there, if it's royalty, it's going to be expensive. Some people can't buy it, can't afford it. So where are you going to go to sell your products? Now, we're going to find out later whether or not she's productive or not, okay? Is, is she selling anything? So we'll see that in just a minute. Now, we also found up here in that same verse, right here, there's a number four, she was listening. And that word listening actually means concentrating. Mm -hmm. So give, do this right here. It said, it said Lydia kept on listening because she was positive at the point of God consciousness. See, the scripture didn't say that, mm -hmm. but we, we know, know right. that as a result of what we studied, mm -hmm. we've got the information. Now we can take that and draw a conclusion. So she kept on listening, okay? because she was positive at the point of God consciousness. Now, what that means is she's not saved at this point. She just knows there's a God out there somewhere. She was a lover of God. That's you know? right. She's a lover of God. Now, I, I, was, I was talking to Daryl about this today, and uh, uh, I, I thought that, you know, if a person, if, as a person is growing up, born, uh, they go through year one, year two, year three, and somewhere along the line, they learn that there is a God out there somewhere. They don't know where, don't know it, know anything about him. They just realize. Now, isn't it interesting that the book of Romans tells us that you can know, chapter 1, you can know just by the things that are made that mm -hmm. there is a God out there. So once you realize that there is a God out there, you have an important question to ask yourself. Do I want to know more about him? So the, the issue then is, do you want to know more? That's positive religion. And if you are positive at that point of God consciousness, God tells us that he is responsible to get the gospel to them or to get them to the gospel. There's missionary activity, okay? So anyway, she's positive at the point of God consciousness. We also have another thing here. The Lord opened her heart. Now, the Lord opened her heart. She didn't open her heart. That's, then, well, what's wrong with that? I didn't think that God forced himself on somebody. The Lord opened her heart. What does that mean? How do we understand that? Well, the barrier to hearing the gospel in every case is the human soul minus the spirit. Therefore, as with all unbelievers, 
the Holy Spirit acting as the human spirit opens the door for Lydia to understand the gospel. So see, what happens is in your life and mine, we're born again Christians, and every person on the line with us today is, if they're, if they're born again, and as I look down the list, I can't see Facebook, but <clears throat> as I look down the list here, I know that every one of these people that are online with us claim to be born again. <clears throat> if that's the case, they have not only a body and soul, they're trichotomous now. They have a whole. They have the human spirit on the inside of them, and the Holy Spirit indwells that spirit. So what now? What happens now is the Holy Spirit guides us. He teaches us. <coughs> he he communicates doctrine to us. He bears witness, and he confirms the truth. So that's what happens to you and me. But a an unbeliever doesn't have a human spirit, but the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit and gives it. it he he can. Confirms he his his responsibility his responsibility is to see to it that this person has an opportunity to hear the gift the, the gospel and understand that gospel. So the Holy Spirit's acting as a human spirit to do this. So the Lord opened her heart and He used the Holy Spirit to do that. Okay. Now in verse 15, we're going to see that Lydia becomes a Christian. Now uh, at this point in time, Paul is on his second missionary journey. And when he, if he was, if he was speaking, if he was speaking to an unbelieving Jew, there's a possibility under the circumstance he may give them the gospel of the kingdom. That is in that is in this transition period. So depending on how far we are into the transition period, Paul may, in fact, on an occasion with an unbe- unregenerate Jew, may give him the gospel of the kingdom. But under under normal conditions, after we after we saw him on that first missionary journey, he's now on a second missionary journey, and he's going to be preaching for the most part. He's going to be preaching the gospel of grace. So what we find here is Lydia is going to become a Christian. It doesn't say that, but we draw that conclusion. Verse fifteen, Steve. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, "If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house." And she prevailed upon us. That, that that's that's interesting. Okay. Now in our in our exposition of that, and when she who's she Lydia. Okay. When she and her household whose household Lydia's Lydia's household. household. So that means that now watch this. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. So yeah, somebody just, told somebody else. Told somebody else the gospel. Okay, but hang on. No, no, not yet. Just not just yet. That's not what. And that's not where where I want you to go. What I want you to understand is this is why I'm saying. You learn something here, and if you remember what you learned there, when you get down here and read something else, whoa, that makes more sense. Because if I didn't, if I didn't remember that down here, when I get down here and read, oh yeah, and oh, when she yeah. and her household had been baptized, she didn't live there. Was there? You <laughs> See, there you go. So what this means is, we know she had a home back in Pythagora. Mm-hmm. Guess what? If she got a household here in, in Philippi, you must have another house. <laughs> in fact, okay, that's exactly. Right. Oh, I know, let's see. I wonder how she paid for it. Well, she was selling to the wealthy people of the royal. There you go. <laughs> there you go, Steve. See, that's exactly right. So she had a household. She had a home in Thyatira, and she had this household, this in home Philippi. in Philippi, so that when she went back home, she had a place to stay. When she came up over here, she had a place to stay while she was doing her doing her business. Okay. So she had this household, and it says, and when she and her household had been baptized. Now, isn't this interesting? Because we've seen all along the way that when a Jew became a believer, a Messianic Jew, they had to be what? Circumcised. Well, that no, not Jew. They're already well, baptized. Circumcised. Yeah. That's right. See, the Jew is already right, right, circumcised. Right, 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 right. But they had to be baptized. And it was that washing. It wasn't wasn't baptism like we know. It's it was a washing. It was a ceremony, a ritual that washed away ritually. It washed away their sins. So what happens is people see this and say, "Oh yeah, she Paul's baptizing her. Therefore, she must be a Jew. She be she was an unbeliever who became a Messianic Jew. Not so. And we'll learn how, why that is not so. She became a Christian, and yet." Paul baptized her, and we also see later on, when you're reading the epistles of Paul, that Paul said, Jesus did not send me to baptize. And we've already learned in Acts chapter 15 that that James and Peter 
said to the to the Jerusalem Council, these Gentiles have become been believers, but we want you to know we agree with Paul. They don't have to be baptized, and yet Paul is baptizing her here. So we want to find out why that is so. Mm. See, now what happens when you see when you hear this? Then what happens is people say, "Oh yeah, Paul was." Paul was called by Jesus to be a to be a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles, and he told us over here God didn't Jesus didn't require him to baptize, so here he's baptizing. Oh yeah, back here he had Timothy circumcised. That's Jewish information. So Paul apparently has gone into reversionism. Oh no, no no. We'll find out. You know, we'll, we have an explanation for that, a rationale. So. When Lydia and her household had been baptized, what did she do? She urged us, she urged Paul, Silas, uh, uh, Paul, Silas, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, urged them to stay in her home, okay? And she, and she, and she, let it, she prevailed upon us, Paul and his team. So they stayed there for a period of time. Now, read this next point, Mr. Apparently, Lydia frequently traveled to Philippi since she had a house there, too. See, mm-hmm. see you get that idea? Okay, what's this next point? She just probably read, had... Read it, yeah. read it a sentence. Oh, go ahead. Just, yeah. but when you do read it, just sentence at a, sentence at a time. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, she probably had guest quarters of some type since she had a household. And yep. She mm-hmm. was evidently fairly wealthy since she was involved in a trade that would have most likely been lucrative. See, all that is... Yeah. Then all that makes when sense. When it means household, I mean, it's her children, means they were servants and made whatever. They maintained anybody in their realm of influence there. Now, well, but they were, they were all, they they were all part, part of her family. Part of her family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, again what? Again, purple dye had to be gathered drop by drop from a certain type of shellfish, a murex, and from the root of a certain type of plant, the matter plant. Uh, purple was the color of royalty thus indicating that her clientele could afford more expensive uh, linens and cloths, and that resulted from such a labor uh, that was so extensive as that process. That's right. But anything that's, that's costly, it takes a lot of effort to get that's it rare. Right. That's and exactly. the rarer it is, the more costly it is. Yeah. That's exactly right. So this gives us a background, you know, about this about this woman. And uh, then in verse 16, yeah. uh, now here, what, in, from here down now, Mm-hmm. I've stopped giving two verses, okay, uh, the same verse twice, and I, I thought, you know, I wanted to try to see if if, if I can explain these passages uh, in a in an equal kind of a way, or maybe a better way by doing it this way without having to put two verses there. Okay, are we going to go to where you explain about her baptism or being baptized? I think so. It, okay. I think it's, it's going to come up. Okay. I, I think it's going to come up either tonight, but we'll we'll talk about mm-hmm. it, okay? So verse 16, verse 16 says, and just read, just read the, the bold, uh, and then we'll okay. come back and fill it in. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who had bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Okay, so you get the, get the picture mm-hmm. there. So mm-hmm. here, now Lydia's been saved. Lydia and her mm-hmm. household have been saved. Remember, they stayed in this place for, for several days. That's what it says. So what happened is now they're going to the place of prayer again, and they run into a slave girl, Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke. They're going to pray. But they run into a slave girl, and this slave girl was, she had a, had a what now? She had a, 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 de, a, a spirit right of div, divination. She had a spirit of divination. And mm-hmm. what does that mean? She's like demon-possessed. She wasn't like. She was. She was. <laughs> yeah, she was demon-possessed, Okay. And so this girl met them, met Paul and his team. And it's and here's what was happening. This girl then, who was a who was a slave girl, she was working for somebody who was making money money from her, okay? So it says this girl met us who was bringing her masters. And who are these masters? Mm-hmm. They are a local crime syndicate using this girl to make money for them. And she was demon possessed, and this was the this was the so Paul and his team runs into this girl. So number one, Paul, Paul and his team met a slave girl on the way to pray. On the way to pray, that's what the verse tells us. Now, what about this girl? The slave girl was demon possessed. Absolutely. Point three. The slave girl was controlled by men who were profiting from her prophecies. That's exactly right. So 
as a, as a, a divinator, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 doing the doing the uh, her her divine uh, divination type mm-hmm. thing. She was actually prophesying. Okay, now w- once that happened, Paul says in verse seventeen here. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are, are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Yes. Uh, now, let's stop and consider mm. that again. So, following after. So, who's following after Paul? Who's doing this? Uh, who is she? Uh, Lydia? No, no. You're talking about? Who, no, verse 16, who was the Oh, oh this, this uh, slave girl. That's girl. right. So she, so what happens now, they've met up somehow. They yeah, they did. Other, yeah. they, well, that, what, no, what happened is Paul, they ran into her yeah, yeah. on the way to prayer. Yeah. Now, what happens, we, we know from verse 16 who she is. But what is she doing now? Right here in the first part of the verse, what's she doing? Following after Paul and and the others, yeah. So no matter where he no matter where he went, she was going. where they went, she was following him. Okay. Now this is a demon possessed girl, hmm. and the issue is Paul is out here to evangelize, and now Satan's got something involved here where he's got this demon possessed woman that are out there antagonizing, antagonizing, antagonizing. Okay. And what she did is she what she do here? She kept doing what? Crying out. So she's out there calling out, calling out. And what was she saying? These men are bond servants of the Most High God. Okay, no one. Mm-hmm. See, that show, she's actually telling people. Yeah. Now, now watch this, Steve. Yeah. This is this is subtle. Right. This is subtle. Here's the issue. She's a demon possessed woman, and yet, when, mm-hmm. if she tells, if she's telling the people out here. These men are bond servants of the Most High who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Does that sound something like she's promoting or is she making fun? Making fun? No, no, that, no that's okay. No, I understand that. But that's not going to, I want to give you two options. She's either promoting him, promoting that team, or she's lying. Is she lying or is she telling the truth? Telling the truth. Okay, so here's the issue. You must have some insight. Sometimes. No, hang on. <laughs> well, is that what she, that's the demon possession. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She has she has insight here. So she's telling them, and of course here again, these are she's either have already been out there preaching evangelistically to to Lydia and her group. So here's the issue. She is going along and she's actually telling the people the truth about what Paul and and, and Silas and are doing. Question. Who do you who do you want promoting you, God or Satan? God for sure. See that? See what's happening here? What's happening here is this is like a she's acting like as a public relations agent for them. And so when you see, when you look out here and you see somebody who's being promoted by a by someone who is a liar, someone who's a uh, who is a a demon possessed person, someone who is a uh, who is a um, uh, 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 from the crime syndicate? Oh, my discredit. See, yeah. see that? So that's exactly right. So you've got this demon possessed person who is actually being a a promoter, mm-hmm. promoter of him. So when people see this woman promoting them, they got they can't believe that Paul's actually for real. Yeah. You see that? Knowing the source of where she's coming that, from. See, that's yeah. exactly right. So following after Paul and us. She kept crying out, saying, "These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation." Let's take a look at the points here. Mm-hmm. Number one, the slave girl followed Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Continued to make the announcement. See, there he's announcing out there. Okay. Now, everything the slave girl said was correct. See, that's what you have to realize. Mm-hmm. But the issue is, while she's saying it is correct, I'm looking at this mm-hmm. woman telling me about what these guys are doing I may believe what she's telling me but I don't believe I don't believe the whole thing because I know who she mm-hmm. is coming from that source that's exactly like right said, considering the source that's, that's right <laughs> point number three uh, the, the slave girl tells the listening audience that Paul knows the way of salvation she's telling them that mm-hmm. But, like, look who's telling, yeah, but look who's telling us that. That's how tricky Satan is in his deception. Absolutely. Yeah. Point number five. Four. This slave girl was controlled by Satan, and Paul didn't want or need Satan for his public relations. See, that's the point mm-hmm. right there. He doesn't need this Satan 
to be his public relations agent. So point number mm-hmm. five. Well, Paul is one of the few people who had the sense to realize that God provides listeners without a public relations agent. See, Paul understood that. I don't, I don't need you. See, and that's why even today, Steve, we don't get up tight. When you look up here now, here it is after all these years of, of preaching and preaching, you'd think, boy, after all these years, Jim, you had have an audience out there that's just absolutely overwhelming, you know. You, know, you, you can't, don't have enough space to put them in. Yeah, they need it, but they're just... Well, not, that's yeah. right, but here's the issue. See, it's not a, it is not about a numbers game. So what we have to do is be satisfied with what God provides. And here is Paul is one of the few people who had a sense to realize that God provides the listeners. Not say not anything. that's right. It's like not I don't saying. need your endorsement. The word I want to use. That, I don't need your endorsement on this. You know. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So all we have to do is be open and willing to tell the truth when the opportunity arises. And by the way, that's true if you go down the list up here. The list of people are online with us here on WebEx. The list of people are over here on Facebook. It's not a matter. You Listen, all you have to do is to be ready. I, I, told, uh, I told my wife yesterday, uh, yesterday was uh, Senior Citizens Day at Kroger. So I took the shopping list and I went to Kroger and I'm, I'm going around and putting my stuff in the basket and I got over to the produce area. And there's a, there's a, a gentleman in the produce, a, a black gentleman in the produce area that's a born again Christian. And in, you know, in just going about my business in, at, at wherever, wherever I am, I, uh, I struck up a conversation with him several weeks ago and came to find out that he's a born-again Christian. I told him I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian too. Well, we've, we've had many, many good conversations. And yesterday when I went in, I just looked up and there he was in the produce again. And I reached over and he, he was looking in another direction. I reached over and touched him on the shoulder. He said, oh, my goodness, pastor. He said, I'm so glad to see you. I said, really? Yeah. He said, yeah. He said, I haven't seen you in quite some time now. I've been two or three weeks. He said, I haven't seen you quite some time now. And he said, but I, he said, I, he said, I need your prayer. I need your prayer. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm going to have surgery. And it would be today. He said, I'm going to have surgery tomorrow on my knee. And he said, uh, I, I really need prayer. I said, okay, uh, Travis, let's do this. So I put my arm around him, and we're standing there in the produce area. <laughs> we got our heads bowed down, and I told Dennis, I don't ever know anybody saw us. There were people in there. People looking by. I don't really knew what we were doing, but I had my arm around him. We had our heads down, and I'm praying for uh, for the doctors and the nurses and technicians. We're going to be dealing with him today. Mm-hmm. And when I got done, I said, "And amen." He looked at me and says, "Oh, he says, I'm so glad you came by." <laughs> See, this is what happens. Just like them meeting yeah. up, it was yeah. God. That's the whole thing that God ordained that timing on that too. I hadn't seen him in you quite. Yeah. Hadn't seen him in quite some time. You know? So th- this he is was how, positive. You were positive. You were going about your way, and y'all. Yeah, this is how God works, mm-hmm. okay? So you don't have to you don't have to go out and looking for him. There you run into him, <laughs> yeah. okay? So verse six, verse eighteen, just the bow part, or yeah, no, yeah, you just read the just read the bow. Mm-hmm. Uh, she continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, "I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her." And it came out at that very moment. Now let me point out something. This is what Paul did then. This is this is prior to the. time. Mm-hmm. The canon of scripture was completed, mm-hmm. and so today we have people that are uh, doing the same thing, you know. And look, I'm not I'm not jive topping them. Do what you want to do, because you have an appointment with Jesus to be Messiah uh, after the rapture of the church, okay? And that'll get straightened out there. So I'm not into this now because I don't think it's valid today. But Paul understood it here, and so what he did is he he looked at, over at the, the she, he'd been in town several days. And every place he goes, here she is out there promoting him, telling the people the right thing. Oh, he's a man of God. He's giving you the, he's giving you the, the way of salvation. Paul got annoyed at that. And he turned and said to that demon, what did he say? He mm-hmm. said, I do what? He, right here, I do what? Right command. Here? That's right. Command he com- you. To come out of her. And he commanded her to come out, that demon to come out in the name of whom? Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. And what happened? It came right out. About a half hour later? No, right instantly. (laughs) It came out at that very moment. Now, what do we learn about this? First of all, 
Paul was greatly annoyed that the slave girl continued to follow him about. That's right. And we have a principle here. And what's the principle? Neither Paul nor any other Christian need help from the devil's crowd for, from religion. See, that's, see, we don't see religion there is used in a negative way. Mm-hmm. Christianity is not a religion. Mm-hmm. You look up you look up religion in a dictionary and an encyclopedia and it'll list all these these people who worship in some form of God and it'll have Christianity in there. We want us to understand that is a misnomer. That is not correct. Christianity is not a religion. It is a spiritual way of life. Period. So Paul doesn't need any other Christian help from the devil. And he doesn't need it from religion. And I got to thinking today, Steve, um, you, how many times? Well, you, if you if you see out on Facebook, I don't. Let me just ask you if you've seen it. There is a there is an advertisement almost every day when I go on Facebook. And as you're scrolling down the news feed, not on my timeline, but on the news feed, there's an ad out there that's telling you if you would just come and take a look at what we've got. We're going to teach you how to grow your your uh, membership from 20 to 400 in mm-hmm. X number. Uh, your, your Listen, your, your, all your this is problem. is public relations. That's it. And when you take a look at the mega churches today, not all of them, but many of the mega churches today are losing members because you only go so long, and as the pressure ramps up out here, you realize that this song that you sang, this prayer that you prayed, this sermon that you heard, the Sunday school class you went to, the fellowship class you went to, it is empty. It's not helping at all, okay? So we don't need public relations, Steve, and that's the, that's the issue here, okay? Now, moving on, uh, uh, there's a couple others. So the principle is neither Paul nor any other Christian that's us. We don't need help from the devil's crowd. We don't need it, need it from religion. Are you from a denomination? That's right, from a denomination. Our Christian, a Christian assistance only comes from the Lord. That, that, and see, that's the issue right there. Mm-hmm. Christian assistance, assistance comes only from the Lord. And we have to be willing to believe that and wait upon him to provide, okay? Point three here, and we're still in that same verse where he's annoyed, he cast the demon out of this girl, okay? Well, at that point, Paul commanded the demon to come out of that slave girl, and the demon obeyed him. That's exactly right. And he come out of the name of Jesus. Now, we have another pr- principle here. There can be no peaceful coexistence between the Lord Jesus and the devil. That's right. No coexistence together. That's exactly right. So what we find here now is this lucrative racket that's been going on, <laughs> this uh, crime syndicate that's using this slave girl, this racket is just about to be terminated mm-hmm. in verse 19, Steve. But, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the, the marketplace before the authorities. Yeah, okay, I say now <laughs> here, here comes the persecution. Yeah. See, he just messed up. The they're, devil's they're the go, devil's ballywick, okay. Just to lay their golden egg. That's <laughs> exactly right. Just messed them up, okay. So we see here who is this? But but when her masters, who's her? The slave girl. The slave girl. And who were her masters? Those crime syndicated guys. <laughs> That's exactly right. And when they saw these crimes, the crime syndicate, when they saw that their hope of profit was gone, the demon had come out of the girl. It's no, she's not going to do that anymore, okay. Right, yeah. So what happened then, when that happened, these slave, uh, these slave masters, the crime syndicate, what did they do? They seized Paul. Now, when, when it says they seized him, what did they do? With violence. They seized him with violence. And what did they do? Paul and Silas? Dragged they, him. They dragged him, them into the marketplace before the authorities. Now, even remember, we are in Philippi. This is, they are under Roman, Roman law, law at this point in time. And Roman law says there are certain things you can and you cannot do, one of which is you can't beat a Roman mm-hmm. citizen, okay? Now, these authorities are, are going to deal with Paul. So let's take a look at number one here. Greek courts and courts of the ancient world were held at the city gates. Okay, that's where they were, okay? Mm-hmm. However, however, the marketplace is where the city administration and Roman courts are located. That's right. That's where the Roman courts are held. Mm-hmm. So the Greek courts are held at the city gate. But here, the Roman courts, it's a Roman, Roman town, mm-hmm. Roman colony. So they're going to be held 
at the marketplace, okay? Number three, the authorities were the magistrates of, of a Roman colony, and they were persons who administered justice. So they're going, so what happened is, and it's amazing, the crime syndicate takes it to the, oh. to the, to the civil authorities, okay? Now, what happens then when, these, when this crime syndicate gets there, in verse 20 and 21, what we're going to find out is they are going to falsely accuse Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. Okay? Now, false accusations. Does that ring a bell today? <laughs> There's so much that going on in the political world. Right? Absolutely. So let's read verse 20 and 21 together because this is where you're going to get the false accusations. Let's just read verse 20 and read the, read the, um, the bold part print. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they uh, said to the, these men, they're throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. Yeah. So now, now watch. Being Jews, okay, that, that's, that's important here. But they've taken the magistrates. Now let's go back here and read verse 21 and come back and... And, uh, and, yeah, and they are proclaiming customs, which is not lawful for us to accept, or to observe being Romans. Okay, see, so what we have here is this, this crime syndicate is saying, these people are Jews and we're Romans, okay? So we've got that dichotomy here. So let's go back and read verse 20 again. So when they, who's they? The crime syndicate. What did they do? They brought them, Paul and Silas. And where'd they take them? Take them to those chief magistrates. And who were they? They, they the crime syndicate then, said to those authorities. That's right, see, they're taking them before the authorities. And made who, a false accusation. These men, let's talk about Paul and Silas, they're throwing our city into confusion. And, and Paul and Silas, that's talking about them being sure. Jews. See, you know? Because they're Jews. So what happened is, see, they're not recognizing Paul as a Roman at this point in time. They're telling the, they're telling the magistrates, why? They're telling the magistrates, these are these guys, these are Jews. And they are in Roman territories. And, yet, and guess what they're doing, Mr. Authority? They're actually preaching and proclaiming some stuff out there that we can't believe. These are Jews and we're Romans, okay? So that's why in verse 20, 21, Paul and Silas, and they're Jews. That's what, that's what these crime syndicates tell them. And they're proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe. Why? Because we're Romans, okay? Now, so the false accusations are on their way. Now watch this. Point number one, sarcasm will fill these accusations. So these people are being sarcastic when they're talking mm -hmm. this magic. So what is it? And here's the sarcasm. First of all, these men exist as Jews. And, and yet, what's the other? But we, we being Romans, Romans. Yeah, they're Jews, but we're Romans, okay? Then paraphrasing this, go ahead. Then paraphrasing the sarcastic accusations end with and we, being Romans, meaning if these men are Jews and we are Romans, we're right and the Jews are always wrong. Yes. See, that's, see these sarcastic accusations, they, rent, they end with, are we, we. being, uh, that's a whole phrase, okay? See, that goes up here, the whole mm -hmm. phrase, uh, uh, are, are, throwing, are throwing our city into confusion being Jews. But again, they're Romans, and that's the idea. So point number three. The authorities had no basis to indict Paul and Silas under Roman law. So the only possible thing the crime syndicate could do was to make the issue racial. See, they, mm -hmm. they, they, can't, they can't do this. Even if they knew he was a Roman, they, they know they can't do this. That's really depend on this. That, that's exactly that's right. Basis. So and what they do is they say, oh, yeah, so, okay. I'm that gonna, sounds familiar today, too, doesn't it? Makes it a racial deal. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. See, they were lying anyway. See, so well, they're out there spreading stuff that we can't, we can't do. So let's get just a bit of history here, Steve. The re reason racial prejudice became the particular indictment issue was because during the reign of Claudius, there was a tremendous antagonism towards the Jews. So much so that Claudius threw the Jews out of Rome. See, that's a, so you got to go back and take a look at that. See, these Jews, are, these Jews are here. Are they? We don't know. We don't need to be having them in here. Oh, so what did, Nero, what did Nero do? See, Claudius reigned, and then when he went up to see Nero came in, and here they, under Claudius we had this idea that uh, Jews just not acceptable here. So you get all these Jews out of here. Now Nero comes in. After Claudius mm. goes off the scene, and what does well, happen? Nero has uh, now come into authority, and he continued where Claudius left off. However, during his reign, 
Claudius changed his mind and finally recognized the validity of Jewish activity in the Roman Empire. So, okay, so we got that. Now, what happens now is we find in the next verse persecution again. Now, mm -hmm. what I mean by that? Persecution again. We've seen persecution back here on the first missionary journey. Every place they went, they got run out of town. So here we go. We're going back. We're coming back the other way now on the second missionary journey. And now we're going to get persecution again. So watch this. Go ahead. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now watch this. The multitude rose up together. So they that means gathered up a group. That, that's a whole oh, bunch. Yeah. There's the mob. The mob, okay. mob they, get, yeah. they get them all together. And they rise up against Paul and Silas and his team. And the, the magistrates, the magistrates rent off their clothes. They tore their clothes off, okay? And what did they do? They commanded to beat them. Mm. Peter, uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. He commanded them to be beaten. Now remember, Paul is a Roman citizen. Roman citizen and there's a law that says you can't do this to a Roman citizen, okay? So they're going to beat him. Now, what happens here? Point number one. Here the law authorities became influenced by the mob violence and by riots. See, that? see that's, uh, So you take a look at Venezuela right now. See? All that, all that mob down there. Think of the trial of Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. They influenced the authorities. So I washed my hands of this, but I'm going to be influenced and let this happen, you know? Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. right, Steve. So when this happens... Yeah, what? when this happens, it indicates the weakness of the law at the local level. See, oh. stand up to the people. See, now here's the issue. Mm -hmm. The Roman... We're going to find out that the Roman, the Roman um, Empire, Empire. For, 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 for years and years and years... They were a very strong empire the the because they believed in the law and order, okay? Mm -hmm. So here, these authorities, though, are going to buckle un under to the, violent, to the violence crowd, and they're going to say, okay, just go ahead and, and, and um, do what you want to. Whip them, yes, okay? So what the, when this happens, it indicates the weakness of mm -hmm. the law at mm -hmm. the local level. Might not be out there in another city, but here in town... This is a weak government, okay? Now, what's the principle here, Steve? The law should never be influenced by shouting, rioting, and the viciousness of a mob. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. right. And we need, well, listen, we need to understand that today mm. because we've got crowds mm. right now. Uh, how, how, about, how about these people that are going into, into, uh, into mm. college, colleges, uh, colleges, universities? They're going in to speak. And they're getting run out of town because the because the mob has become so unruly that they're not willing to allow free speech. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the principle again, the law. Go yeah, ahead. The law should never be influenced by shouting, rioting, or the viciousness of a mob. That's exactly right. Point three. Here again, authorities appear to be more impressed by the mob than with the accusation. So yeah. So okay. So we 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 we've got this accusation here. And uh, they could very well say, well, we can't do anything because, you know, these guys are rowing over here. Mm -hmm. But they were influenced by the mob more so than by the accusation. And point number four. The authorities are under pressure, and the pressure comes from mob violence. That's exactly right. Now, in, point, uh, in verse 23, what we're going to see here is Paul and Silas at this point, and, 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 Luke, and uh, Luke and Timothy, they're going to be imprisoned illegally, okay? Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Yes, okay. So what's this? And when they had laid many stripes on them, when they, who's they? The Roman law. The Roman law enforcers. They are enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. the, the command is beat them. So they enforce the law. And what they did is they laid many stripes on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So they, the law enforcers, what did they do then? They cast them into prison. See, they beat them. Now they've thrown them into prison. And what do they do? They're charging the jailer. They're telling the jailer to keep them safe, guard them safely. And that's right. Mm -hmm. So what that means is they, they, uh, they beat them, they cast them into prison, and they said, okay, you, jailer, lock them up. You lock them up, I'm commanding you to do this, and you make sure you guard them safely. 
This wasn't just, oh, yeah, we'll go in there and, and lock the door and, you know, go take a lunch, you know, go to lunch or whatever. No, you guard them safely. Now, we see here that they had they laid many stripes on them. Look at point number one. The number of stripes was usually 39 in number. Now, can you imagine this? They're going to they're mm. beat them with a cane rod. Mm. And uh, let's, let's read this next, next A point. cane rod was used for whipping, and it peeled the skin off the back. Mm. You, you just beat them so, many, so oh, much yeah. that by the time you get done, the, the skin, well, we saw that same thing happen with Jesus. So here they're peeling the skin off the back when they're, when they're yeah. beating them here. Remember, when Paul was a Roman citizen, and we've been a Roman citizen, it was a serious offense and was prohibited. So what they're doing is they're doing what? Breaking they're, the law. They're breaking the Roman <laughs> law, okay? Keep that in mind. If Paul had complained, Rome could have removed all privileges from the city. See, so, see, so, so pressure. <laughs> that's right. So, <laughs> see, that's the issue now. These administrators, these rulers of the city are going to come to realize, whoa, whoa we look up. what we have done here, okay? So all privileges. So Rome is, is, is guiding all this stuff. Say, okay, your privileges are removed. The taxation deal, no sir. Yeah, that was for taxing you. All this, the, the freedom that you have, no, that's all gone now. And it would all be because these rulers violated the law, okay? Now, in verse, 20, in verse 24, they're jailed. No, watch this. They're jailed where? Under, in prison. No. They're look, jailed in the under prison. They're jailed in the under prison. See, it's the under prison. They're not in prison. Mm -hmm. They are in the under prison. Okay? Read verse 24. Uh, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in okay. the thought. See, here it's called the inner prison, but we need to know what that inner mm. prison is. They're not just in jail. They are in the inner prison. Okay? Mm. So, uh, who is it that's going to put them there? The right. Philippian jail. The Philippian jail. That's mm -hmm. the guy that's been ordered to, to, to guard him. Put him in jail and guard him, okay? So he received he received that charge, and what did he do? He thrust them into the inner prison, and that inner prison is called the what now? Under prison. The under prison. We're going to see something about that. And what did he do with, with them here? He put their feet in the stocks. You know? Put their feet in stocks. So what that means is they are in this under prison. They can't move. They're, they're, and here they're bleeding and whipped and all, man. Yeah, that's, mm. that's, well, mm. okay, now keep that in mind. Their feet are in stocks, they are in the under prison, and they've been beaten now to where their backs are, their backs are raw, raw bleeding, mm. okay? Now let's keep that in mind, point number one. The Romans always had a system where they had a prison that went underground. So you got a prison, mm. but you got one underground, okay? Mm. So this is the under prison, okay? Mm -hmm. And watch this. Point two. Half of the prison would be at street level where the guards had their barracks. Okay, so you got guards up mm -hmm. here on, on ground level, and that's where the barracks are. Mm -hmm. Half the prison, but down here, point three. The lowest part of the prison was the under prison and was the most secure area. So you know, like solitary confinement. That's, that, that's exactly right, just like solitary confinement. But watch, that's not all. Mm -hmm. What about this under mm -hmm. prison? Look here. The under prison was like a pit where all the sewage dra uh, sewage drained from the other prisons and was rat infested. Boy. Uh. Now get the picture, folks. Mm -hmm. Get the picture. You don't get this until you understand the history. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not just in jail. They are in the under prison. And all of the sewage that's coming from up here is down here in this pit where they are stinking, slimy, gooey, with raw, place. open wounds. That, they, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. And rats running and they everywhere. They can't do anything because our feet are locked up. That, and they up. can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So I ask this. This is what happened, okay? Mm -hmm. And you get to verse 25, and I have to ask this question before we get there. We now know where they are. They're in the under prison. They're beaten. Their backs are bloody. They are, uh, their feet are in stock. They're in a stinky, stinking rat hole with rats running every place. All this sewage, stinky sewage. And I say, can you believe this? Mm. Can, no, that, no, hang on. Can you believe this? So you're saying, believe what? Well, let's mm. take a look. Watch this. Mm -hmm. They're in, in this situation. Look at verse 25. Here they're happy and going up. And at midnight, 
Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So here they are. They the work, are in this stinking hole, rats everywhere, sewage, bleeding, backs, well, be uh, beaten, that, skinless, got their feet in stocks, and they are praying. Okay, now what's point number one? Praying. We can understand that Paul and Silas would be praying. I guess so. And, and, that, and that's, and then that's also what? Timothy and Luke. You, you, sure, in a, in a mess like this, sure you could expect them to be praying. But number two. But singing praises to God for being in a stinking rat infested prison at midnight? <laughs> I mean, by this time, at least at midnight, you think maybe they're going to go to sleep, but they can't be. They're just hurting. Mm -hmm. Okay? But they're, they're praying. And they're singing praises, and guess what? The prisoners that hear the the other well, here we here it is, point three. The other prisoners didn't just hear Paul and Silas; they were impressed by what they heard. Well, they were impressed by what they heard. But they knew too the conditions of that horrible place they were in. As prisoners themselves, they knew what it was. Well, they were there. Yeah, they're they were down there. They they I imagine even people above them could hear. You know, well, I, I'm not going to go there. I don't yeah. know. I don't yeah. know whether they could or not. Somebody but, did. <laughs> that's exactly right. The prisoners that were down in that hole with them. They heard this, okay? And, man, they were really impressed by this. So Paul and Silas pray, and guess what? They're praying and singing, and when they pray, God intervenes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. Point verse, verse And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's hands, bands were loosed. Yes. Now, wow. in the last four minutes, I, we, we got to where I, where I was oh, hoping yeah. we'd get here. Mm -hmm. What I want you to see is then all of this. Here's the persecution for doing the right thing. They're down in the most rotten, stinking hole. They're praying at midnight and singing praises to God. And bingo, guess what? We have an earthquake. Okay, mm -hmm. verse 26. I already read that. Oh, did you really? Okay. Point number one. Okay, point number one. And apparently the only damage done by the earthquake was the opening of the prison gates and the shackles that were broken. Yeah, just the <laughs> things fell off her feet? Yeah. And the doors opened up. That's definitely a God thing. <laughs> yes. And this seems two. to be the only purpose of the miracle was the earthquake is to do this. That's, that's exactly right. Nothing else happened. That's exactly right. Mm. So now what happened is uh, the door, uh, this should be, there should be an A in there. Uh, the guard is what? He's about to kill himself. See, he's, he's been commanded to guard mm. He them. knows the rules. He's going to, if he, they get out, he's a dead man. They said, guard him safely. Mm -hmm. Guard him safely, okay? So, verse um, verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. So, they, he went, oh, look at what's happened here. Uh, so, anyway, point number one. Well, the guard assumed that all the prisoners escaped, and he knew that the Romans would kill him for this. Okay, now, slow him down, okay? Point number two. The guard knew that there was nothing left for him to do but to take his own life. See, that's exactly right. He thinks that's probably going to be easier than what they would do to him. Well, you're going to see that in a minute. Oh, really? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Point number three. Here's the problem. The Romans would have killed him by process of slow torture, and he would right. rather die quickly by his own hand. Hey, that's, yeah, that's, what he, yeah. that's exactly uh, right. So he said, oh, okay. But uh, so here, he's about to kill himself, okay? So in verse, and verse 28, stop. We're all here, okay? So Paul said. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. Yeah, every one of them, we're, all of them are there, okay? Mm -hmm. Verse 29. Uh, then he called for a light, and it sprang, and then in came a trembling and fell before Paul and Silas. So the jailer calling for a light. He wants to see, wanted to be able to see. And he was, now see, why was he calling for a light? It's midnight. It's midnight. Mm -hmm. it's, it's after midnight. And so what he did, he didn't just, he just didn't spring in. He charged in. He charged in the prison, okay? And he came, he came trembling. Why would he be trembling? He feared for his life. That's yeah. exactly right, Steve. And he, and he was in a state of agitation and fear. And so he fell down before Paul and Silas. Point number one. The jailer realizes that the prisoners aren't gone. That's exactly right. Point two. The situation was so uncertain to him. That he charged in, fell down as if he was worshiping Paul and Silas. That's exact point three. Paul and Silas's calmness under pressure and their ability to think under disastrous conditions placed them highly in the jailer's estimation. See, Paul, what, Paul and Silas, they didn't, they didn't, and Timothy, they didn't get sh shook up by all this. Okay, this testimony. That's exactly right. So, 
a point of, of that's that's verse 13. Oh, see, point. We're look here. About through. Oh, yeah. 50 seconds before <laughs> time to close. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is pick up now on in verse 30. And uh, there's 40 verses in in this chapter. So I think 42. I think it is. But we'll finish these then on Saturday and go into chapter 17. Now, in in looking back, Steve, just curiously. Is there anything that sticks out in this in this lesson to you? This sure, to you? sure. There's a lot of it. Uh, being positive and available and God in control of the circumstances, he'll do great and mighty things through people. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a, you're in a comfort zone in a grocery store like you were, yes, or yeah. if you're in a pigsty, beaten condition, and and you're praising God and you're you're worshiping Him, yeah. He's still in control. Absolutely. And He can still use you in any way, especially in in ways that look to other people like sure there's no way that would be like a demon possessed person and you know. Okay, well listen, I thank all of you for logging on on Facebook here and, and YouTube. I uh, mean uh Facebook and WebEx and uh, pray go ahead and pray for us, Steve, and we'll uh, we'll get on. Well we thank you for this study and see this great example of things that we've never been through, such yeah. tortures these people and the and the times that we live in and, and yet they were they were faithful as and even to death if they had to, Father. Yeah. And you use them in a great and mighty way that here thousands of years later, we're studying what they did and learning to apply it to our lives. Amen. They had such a, such spiritual, historical impact sure. that it came even till today in, in Maumelle, Arkansas, by Bible teachers sharing this word of God. And, mm -hmm. and so we took and take this uh, boldness of, of living for you yes. into our own zone, our own marketplace, our own sphere of influence that we each have sure. to be positive towards your work, positive towards your leading and, and, and be that light that would lead people towards either saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or to a closer walk with you. So we ask the blessed upon this lesson to go and go and go about in the lives of people. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. And Steve, if you will, just reach up there and hit the finish button there. No, no, down below, no, down the corner, down the right hand corner. Okay, very good. That's good. Okay, so thank you, folks. Going to go ahead and log off here, and we'll see you Sunday morning uh, at uh, eight thirty. God bless all of you.